This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this early edition of the news. A troubled downtown Winnipeg Park is getting a makeover. The city plans to start work redeveloping Air Canada Park on Portage Avenue this summer. As CBC's Cameron McLean reports, the project hopes to advance reconciliation while also addressing safety concerns. Certain people come in here and uh, cause trouble. Darren Bradburn and his friends come to this park at the corner of Portage and Carleton Street every day. It has a rough reputation. People in the area have complained about illegal activity like drug dealing. And emergency services frequently respond to calls related to the park. But for the people who visit the park regularly, many of them homeless, it's a vital gathering space. Don't, don't fix nothing that's not broken, that's all I can say. Okay. It's, it's, it's good. Leave, leave, it, the, leave it the way it is. The city plans to spend $2.5 million to revamp the park. It's part of a $10 million City of Winnipeg strategy to revitalize downtown Winnipeg after the COVID-19 pandemic. Downtown Biz Executive Director Kate Fenske says the park needs investment, but doesn't want to see the people who currently use it pushed out. We know the redesign of the park is really just one part of the solution. So there's a number of organizations talking about how do we increase supports and services for people who use the park. Designs for the park won't be released until June or July, but much of what you see here behind me, the concrete columns, the stone fountain, will likely be gone. Ideas for the new park include a performance stage, more lighting, green space, and improved sight lines. Cherise Sinclair has worked downtown for about a year and often walks by the park. What do you, would you like to see in this park? Um, probably like maybe a new garden or like re, replant flowers. In addition to the physical improvements, City Councilor Cindy Gilroy says the city is looking at programming to support the people who use the park and attract more people to come down. We're trying to make it a very inviting space that would, you know, get everyone to come and use that space in, in, a, 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 um, in an area of town where people don't normally maybe think about going in the downtown. Construction of the new park is set to begin in August and be finished by next spring. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. North Dakota has just passed one of the most restrictive anti-abortion laws in the United States. Apart from medical emergencies, abortions would only be allowed in cases of rape or incest, and then during the first six weeks of pregnancy only. Advocates in Manitoba worry about the impact on women on both sides of the border. CBC's Emily Brass explains. The Women's Health Clinic is the only place you can get an abortion in Manitoba, apart from the HSC Hospital in Winnipeg and the Brandon Hospital. Anyone can make an appointment at the clinic, including women from other provinces and the United States. But the Women's Health Clinic says it's already severely underfunded and overbooked, turning away about 500 women a year. Executive Director Kemlin Nembhard worries the new law will add more strain to waiting lists, putting more people at risk in North Dakota and Manitoba. We can just look at history. You know what happens when abortion is, is severely restricted, right? It doesn't mean that people don't get abortions. They do. They seek out to get abortions. What happens, though, is that people don't have access to safe abortions. And so people will then end up, you know, going to back alley doctors, right, to, to get abortions. And that means people will die. Nimhart says abortions are part of health care and should be better funded across Canada. She and other advocates are also worried that the anti-abortion rhetoric south of the border could influence laws up here. Uh, I felt sick, sick and angry. Kalita Benedictin works with the North Point Douglas Women's Centre, which supports women in that lower-income neighbourhood. She says forcing women to go through with unwanted pregnancies would have horrible effects on mental health and would drive up involvement of the child welfare system. Benedictin also points out that women often don't know they're pregnant within the first six weeks and thinks North Dakota's exception in the case of rape or incest is insincere. We know and have seen how hard it can be for women who have been sexually assaulted or experienced incest to be believed. And when women aren't believed, they're not even going to be able to access those very limited exceptions. So the politics of it is um, devastating. 
The new anti-abortion law still needs to clear North Dakota's Supreme Court. Emily Brass, CBC News, Winnipeg. Family and friends of a 24-year-old woman who was killed in a fatal crash packed a Winnipeg courtroom today for the trial of two co-accused. Jordan Reimer died after a two-vehicle collision at the intersection of Bond Street and Kildare Avenue West in the early hours of May 1, 2022. Tyler Scott Goodman is accused of dangerous driving causing death, impaired driving and failing to stop at the scene. His mother, Lori Lynn Goodman, also faces charges of obstruction of justice and accessory after the fact. Roughly 50 people wore these purple T-shirts in court today, featuring Reimer's name and photo. Her parents, Doug and Karen, say it showed how much Jordan was loved. Yeah, you can see it. And, and we're so happy and grateful for the people that are supporting, not yeah. just Jordan, but us. Well, we need to be a voice for Jordan, and um, we need to make sure that everybody knows that Jordan deserves justice. Yeah. Now, the details released in court can't be reported due to a publication ban, but we can tell you not much happened today. The case has been adjourned until May 15th. Peter Nygaard is challenging his extradition to the United States over a number of issues. His Toronto lawyer appeared in the Manitoba Court of Appeal today. Caroline Bargut was also there. Peter Nygaard has applied for judicial review of his extradition to the United States and on Wednesday a panel of three Manitoba Court of Appeal judges heard his case. Nygaard was not in court. His Toronto lawyer Brian Greenspan appeared on his behalf. Greenspan says when his client consented to be extradited to the U.S., he agreed to face one charge, trafficking in persons. But when Canada's justice minister ordered his surrender, he agreed that Nygaard would face all nine charges listed in the U.S. indictment, including racketeering conspiracy, which isn't an offence in Canada. Greenspan called that a bait-and-switch. Nygaard also wanted assurances that he wouldn't be sent to the Metropolitan Detention Centre in New York, which reportedly has poor conditions. Nygaard is turning 82 this year and there are concerns for his health and safety. He also wanted assurances he wouldn't be subject to civil commitment, which is similar to Canada's dangerous and long-term offender designation. That's because if Nygaard is found not guilty, he could still be locked up for life through civil commitment, which is a civil process and doesn't meet the same bar as a criminal proceeding. Lawyers for the Federal Minister of Justice told the court the minister considered all of Nygaard's concerns before making a decision and concluded that it would not be unjust to surrender him without assurances. Nygaard can't be extradited before his Canadian cases have gone through the courts. He's charged with sexual assault in Toronto. That trial begins September 15th and is expected to last 10 weeks. He's also facing charges in Montreal, but they won't be dealt with until June 2024. The Court of Appeal judges reserved their decision. They say that their office is short-staffed and it's not clear when it will be ready. Caroline Bargut, CBC News, Winnipeg. Canada's federal government is trying to grow the French language in our country. The Prime Minister has laid out a plan worth more than a billion dollars to protect the language outside of Quebec. As Matt Humphrey reports, a recent survey shows more than 8% of Manitobans speak French. Our action plan for official languages is an ambitious five-year plan that recognizes the important economic, social and cultural value of e official languages. The federal government announces more than one billion dollars over the next five years to protect Canada's official languages. The money is intended for things like French language training for immigrants or the preservation of French in education, justice and health care. Salwa Medri is the manager of the Francophone Immigration Network of Manitoba. The Francophone newcomers will not have to choose to either uh, learn or uh, improve their uh, language abilities in French or in English. So now they uh, do, um, they are able to, to do both. French is the first language of just under 3% of Manitobans. Integral to Winnipeg's character, the news is welcome in St. Boniface. Café Postal tries to hire as many bilingual employees as possible. Customer Debbie Gov was visiting from BC. She says it can be hard finding French outside Quebec. I don't have any opportunity to speak French there. Well, I'm just amazed. I, we were driving around Winnipeg just exploring and I said, this looks French. I didn't know they had a 
a vibrant French community here, yeah. Jean-Michel Baudry is with Société de la Francophonie Manitoban. He says there are gaps in services, especially in education. There are investments that will help both with uh, for first language uh, French uh, education, but also for second, uh, for immersion programs, which is also very important for us. The next step is for the province to work with Ottawa on how to best spend the money. Matt Humphrey, CBC News, Winnipeg. Meteorologist John Sauter, that's Sauter. your name, Sasa, Sasa. How long have we stopped been? raining? Yeah, it did stop raining. I'm expecting that. Uh, I've been. Somebody was uh, talking to me earlier today. I need to know when the rain ends. And I said, I think right around the supper hour or just before. And the back edge of the rain is now east of the Red River Valley. It's all on radar. You'll see it very clearly in this next image. And yeah, I think that we'll end up with about six, seven millimeters on the ground at the most. And that's typically because of the speed of the system. It uh, was really trucking along. You can see how, how quickly it's moving. Now the back edge of this rain is east of Winnipeg, uh, clearing the Birds Hill Park area, clearing around, um, I guess, Highway 12. So it should be just ending in the richer area soon. And we'll continue to move out to the east. And in behind the cloud cover, we even see a little bit of clearing. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some sunshine here before sunset tonight. And then we will have a partly cloudy sky overnight and then cloud over again by tomorrow morning. So right now we're at six degrees. We were at eight with the rain dropped to four, now back to six and the wind gusts, which earlier today were up around 60 plus have now really backed off. We have a south wind steady at about 22 kilometers per hour. And so on Futurecast, there's the rain as it continues to move off into Ontario tonight. Some of that could be mixing with a little bit of snow if temperatures fall quick enough. Uh, there's a look at Thursday morning, still some showers out into the Kenora area in the morning and could even see some morning fog in northwestern Ontario. For the rest of us, kind of a cloudy start here and we have this rain that I'm watching just along the international border through the day. So areas like Emerson, Morden, Winkler, you could pick up some showers on into the afternoon. The rest of us, a few little peaks of sun and we'll look for a few little showers moving through as well in the afternoon. Only about a 30% chance and then on Friday, we're back into a sun cloud mix, but there's more cloud and maybe even more showers on the way for Saturday. Additional rainfall, not much in Winnipeg. We still have a little bit more out to the east where that band of rain is really starting to move uh, in that direction. So zero tonight, partly cloudy overnight, cloudy in the morning, light winds, three degrees, and then on into the afternoon, we're at 13 with a mix of sun and cloud and still a chance of a shower along with that. In the north, may see some morning rain or snow followed by some clearing. Temperatures pretty seasonal across the north and we're warming up here in the south. 12 in Brandon, 11 in Portage, a few flurry showers around Swan River. Here in Winnipeg, we're looking at that high of 13. Also in Steinbach and some showers to the south of us. And then in northwestern Ontario, still a chance for some morning fog and a chance for some afternoon showers as well. Thanks so much, John Sauter. Today in the legislature, more allegations of a member of the Legislative Assembly behaving poorly. And we heard a stern rebuke from the Speaker of the House. She says MLAs are taking partisanship too far. The CBC's Ian Fraze joins us now live from our newsroom. What is the latest allegation, Ian? It concerns what Education Minister Wayne Owasco said yesterday about NDP leader Wab Canoe. Take a listen. I actually thought the member from Transcona was going to turn a leaf and, and maybe take some self-serving comments uh, away from his uh, leader of the opposition who seems to stand in this house on a day-to-day -day basis uh, pretending to be some kind of actor. He's no Adam Beach, Madam Speaker. <laughs> The NDP raised that comment today as a matter of privilege, saying the comparison between Canoe and Adam Beach, a well-known Indigenous actor, is demeaning. And it's only happening because they're both Indigenous. It was meant to pretend that there are two sorts of Indigenous people in our province, the so-called good ones and so-called bad ones. Madam Speaker, I need to pause here to make a clear point. The idea that there are good Indigenous people and bad Indigenous people in our province and that the minister can decide who they are and then hurl abuse at one group 
is an awful thought and should never be expressed in this chamber. I could have used multiple other actors. Yes, I used an Indigenous one, Madam Speaker. I did not in any way, shape or form mean to um, intimidate the Leader of the Opposition or talk down to his Indigenous culture, Madam Speaker. There was no ill intent meant. Just pointing out the fact that the Leader of the Opposition is not a great actor and Manitobans are seeing it displayed here today as well as the member for Union Station stands up and tries to smear me, Madam Speaker. So, Janet, not exactly an apology. Owasco went on to continue to make the comparison between canoe and beach. The Speaker says she'll look into it. Now, we also got a ruling today, Ian, on another matter of MLA misconduct. The allegation earlier this month that Wabkanu swore at and shoved Culture Minister Abi Khan while they were both at an event inside the legislature. Now, this is something Kanu has adamantly denied. What did the Speaker say? Not much. The Speaker Myrna Drieger says this happened outside the chamber, so thus outside her purview. But she still had a stern message for all MLAs. I feel, though, that in recent years the temperature in this room has been rising. I feel that the balance between partisan agendas and professional courtesies has tipped in the direction of partisan divisions and away from constructive and collegial interactions. Now that the Speaker's ruling is out of the way, the government in the past hour has released security camera footage that shows the exchange between Khan and Canoe. It is from a distance and there is no audio. So I guess, Janet, our viewers will have to take a look and judge for themselves. Thank you so much for this, Ian. CBC's Ian Fraze reporting live tonight. Fewer people in Manitoba are buying tickets to go see live plays or live performances. We're going to hear from Prairie Theatre Exchange about what this means for the future of the performing arts in our province after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
And now we follow up on a story we brought you earlier this week. Performing arts organizations in Manitoba, and indeed right across the prairies, 20 of them, have written a letter asking the federal government for continued pandemic assistance. Public health restrictions ended more than a year ago, but as you'll remember, theaters were closed for a long time. Still, fewer people are buying tickets to see shows even now. I spoke with the managing director of Prairie Theatre Exchange about the implications of those closures and people not coming back to theatres yesterday. Lisa Lee, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. What has Prairie Theatre Exchange been seeing in terms of recovery from the closures and restrictions of the pandemic? Well, in terms of our audiences, the ones that are back are very enthusiastic to be back. They're energized by theatre. They love coming to our theatre. Um, they're very supportive and love that they're getting to do something that they've so missed for the past three years. I will say, however, numbers are not where we would like them to be uh, compared to pre-pandemic uh, rates. Where are they now? Where are your numbers? Uh, we're performing to about 45 to 50 percent of pre-pandemic levels and uh, you know no theater ever, almost ever placed to 100 percent capacity so we're at 45 to 50 percent of um, what we would normally play to. I realize that the expenses that you have the cost of putting on live theater isn't usually covered by tickets right so if you take the number of tickets you have and even if it's only cut by 30 percent that has to put you in some sort of financial hole. Those expenses haven't changed for us. In fact, they've increased, whether that's inflation or, you know, COVID's driven up costs all over the place. Some companies now have an added cost of understudies to take care of COVID sickness and that kind of thing. So all the costs have remained the same, but likely they've increased, but ticket sales are decreasing. Can you see us coming out of this with time or what kind of intervention do we need? Well, I think we need two things. One is we need to change how we think about this. Um, we're in a moment where it is harder to bring audiences back. So we need to be um, innovating, uh, being innovative in how we do that and how we make theater. The other thing we need is that financial support to bridge us until we get back on our feet. Um, we're seeing that sales are low, but recovery funding has stopped. Stabilization funding has stopped. That math doesn't work for me. We don't have the financial support to get us through this transition period until we fully recover and fully stabilize. What happens if we don't get that stabilization funding? We need to be changing our models. Is it longer runs? Um, uh, so that we have more inventory to sell? Is it a different kind of programming that engages people differently, not better or um, uh, just differently? And so any other business, you know, would be looking to change how we do things. We don't have the luxury to do things exactly as they, as we have been doing them. We need to be changing and, and keeping up with the times. And that will take some time. And this is why I think um, recovery funding is so important while we figure out how we change as a whole sector. Lisa Lee, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. Meteorologist John Sauter joins us after the break with his seven day forecast and then we'll bring you a daily lift you'll want to see. Stay with us.
Your seven-day forecast is on the way. We've got some warmer air to the west of us. Look at uh, Kelowna at 21. We've got 12s and 13s in southern Saskatchewan, and that is drifting into Manitoba tomorrow. For now, though, we're in a little bit of a ridge, or a trough, I should say, that extends down into southern Ontario. Seasonally cool here, considering that a couple of weeks ago, Toronto was at 29 degrees. So the warmer air is moving in. A few more showers on the way for Saturday, then clearing, and it should be a fairly windy weekend next week. We start with some sunny days in a row and look at Wednesday all the way to 17. Looks like we're turning the corner temperature wise next week. A movie theater in Alaska had a surprise visitor recently. This video has been making the rounds. So oh, in case you missed it, check it out. Here's your daily lift. That's a moose. Wow. A moose wandered into the cinema southwest of Anchorage, and staff just watched and videotaped it. Oh. Must have been the smell of the popcorn, because look what he goes for. A tray with some leftover popcorn on it. Was it buttered popcorn? Oh, uh, we well, probably not, because look, he's leaving. Oh. He's just, you know, just forget it. And apparently, John, after he devoured the popcorn, he actually stuck his little face, or his big face, into the garbage and came out with, like, a Happy Meal box <laughs> on, his, on his schnoz. So, hockey's coming up, playoff hockey, here on CBC. It's the Bruins and Florida Panthers, and the Bruins could close out the series. There you go. Thanks for joining us early this evening. See you later.